Thank you for joining CareerCert today for our webinar focusing on building situational awareness as first responders. I'm your host for the webinar, Danielle. Here at CareerCert, we are passionate about helping first responders improve outcomes through innovative online training. We know that for you to best protect and care for those in your communities, you need to be at your best as well, which is why situational awareness is a crucial topic. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter for this webinar, Rick Campos. Rick is a veteran firefighter, paramedic, and educator who has served in the U.S. Air Force and as an officer for the Federal Fire Department. He has experienced firsthand the dangers first responders experience in the field and is passionate about helping emergency responders better protect themselves, their partners, and their patients through developing the awareness skills necessary to identify and avoid hazards. All right, Rick, I will go ahead and turn the time over to you. Hey, how's everybody doing? My name is Rick Campos and I am so thankful to be here as part of this webinar for situational awareness for first responders. First, I wanna say thank you to Danielle for a wonderful introduction and I wanna thank all of you again for attending this wonderful webinar. So that bio was just a real quick snapshot of myself, but one of the things that it didn't talk about was the fact that while I was in Afghanistan after 9-11, I had to understand firsthand what situational awareness was. Because of that, I feel that situational awareness is crucial and it truly is the difference between life and death. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, our overview and objectives are these. At the conclusion of this course, the learner will be able to do the following. We're gonna be able to define situational awareness for the first responders, explain what situational awareness is needed, explain how first responders use situational awareness, discuss the different steps of situational awareness, explain how situational awareness affects first responders' delivery of patient care, and lastly, we're gonna identify tips and tricks for effective situational awareness. All right, but first everybody, let's go ahead and do a poll here. In this poll, I'm gonna ask you this. Have you ever felt unsafe on a call. Now, when I say unsafe on a call, I mean, did you ever have that gut instinct that something wasn't right? Or maybe something actually wasn't right? Where you showed up to your first district and that call came in and you went to it and something just told you like this wasn't right or, or you just felt unsafe. So how many of you guys have ever felt that? I know I could tell you that I myself have felt it. Let's go ahead and check out those uh, that poll. All right. Awesome. So a lot, a lot. So about ninety-one percent. So what is that telling us? That's telling us telling us that yes, while we are in a a, a great profession. Sometimes our profession could be a little bit dangerous, and it's up to us to keep our head on a swivel and stay vigilant and maintain situational awareness. All right, so here's a case study. Picture this. It's a beautiful, sunny Tuesday morning when your ambulance is dispatched to the scene of a male patient experiencing chest pain. As you and your crew step out to grab the equipment, you suddenly hear gunshots. You realize you are being shot at in an ambush. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I wish that this was just a fictional tale that older EMTs tell younger EMTs before they go to bed, but this isn't the case. This truly happened on December 24th of 2012. It wasn't an ambulance, it was a fire engine that showed up to a fire. And in this situation, Firefighters got out and were ambushed. One firefighter passed away, police officer passed away, one firefighter was critically wounded, and another one shot in the shoulder. So as you can see, this is happening. So I applaud CareerSir for bringing this to all of you to put this on the forefront of our minds. So let's think about this. As we review this case study, let's consider some of the following questions. Was there anything you could have done to prevent this scenario? 
Were your actions correct? And were there actions you have taken to keep yourself safe during this ambush? So let's break this down. Was there anything you could do to have prevent this scenario? Well, that's kind of a tricky question because yes, there was, and also no, there wasn't. And I say yes, there was simply because as we come up with our scene size ups, scene size ups don't just happen the moment the tones drop. Scene size ups can happen the night before, scene size ups can happen the morning of. Now, what I mean by that is take today, for instance. Here in Northern California, we are having a beautiful day, but it is going to be 109 degrees today. Oh my goodness, 109 degrees. Right there, my scene size up for the day, my situational awareness is that I, we may be going to some calls that are dealing with heat, heat related illnesses. Are the senior centers in our area, while I know we're kind of going through a different time, but are our senior centers, do they have the cooling they need for our seniors? Things of that nature. To prepare my mind for the class, or I'm sorry, to prepare my mind for the emergency that may happen. So is there anything I could have done to prevent this? Maybe as we come up in our shift, asking the um, the leaving medic or the leading captain or anyone what has transpired. Does anything happen the night before that I need to worry about today? Was there an altercation at a house and we get the call today at the same house? Could that lead me to believe that there may be something there that we may have law enforcement on scene before us? Now, were your actions correct? Now, this is another hard one because I don't really feel that there's a wrong answer here because there's a lot of unknowns. But the thing that we can always feel that is never incorrect is that making safety a priority. Not just safety for yourself, but safety for your partner. And again, safety for the bystander or your patient. And we'll get into that a little further down the road. Were there actions you could have taken to keep yourself safer during this ambush? Possibly. You know, one of the things is take cover. Put yourself between, put something between you and the shooter. This is a hard pill to swallow, but it is happening. And we have to be able to keep our minds sharp and look around and keep that situational awareness. So what exactly is situational awareness, right? I mean, we talk a little bit about keeping your head on a swivel, staying vigilant. We can say all those cool terms. But really what it is is the awareness of the potential risk and dangers present on an emergency scene, including an understanding of how to overcome obstacles as they present to keep all personnel safe. So that's really what it comes down to when we're discussing the situational awareness is being a little bit more proactive as opposed to reactive. Again, as we talk about the National Registry, you know, what is the one thing that we start every national registry skill with? Scene safe, BSI. But as I teach also young paramedic students and young EMT students, they say scene safe, BSI at the very beginning and then they never say it again. Scene safe, BSI should be a constant with the call. You should be constantly reminding yourself, is the scene safe? You know, just like we, we do our vital checks on our patients that are critical and non-critical, every, you know, every five for unstable, every 15, 10 to 15 for a stable patient, we should be doing the same with our scene safety. Is the scene continually safe? Because scenes can change rather quickly. And having that situational awareness will help you prepare yourself for when that happens. So this picture right here brings up a great reminder to me of a time when I wasn't situationally aware of my surroundings. All right, and we're gonna picture this again, right? Close your eyes, picture this. I'm gonna take you on a journey. No, but in all honesty, so imagine this, right? I was a young paramedic student. I was in my intern phase of the paramedic course, and I was blessed to work on a fire engine in the city of Stockton, Stockton, California. 
uh, if anybody knows about Stockton, California, this is where, if anybody's into UFC, this is where the Nate, the Nate, Nate, Nate and Nick Diaz brothers are from. Uh, there is currently a wonderful documentary on the city of Stockton on HBO right now, but it is does have its problem areas. Anyway, so I am a paramedic student, paramedic intern on a fire engine, and we get called to a unresponsive male behind the local gentleman's club. So we arrive on scene. Police are already there. Scene is safe. So I go not inside the gentleman's club, but around to an alley in the back. And there I see a, a middle-aged man and unresponsive. And I go to go, I go to check his responsiveness doing the, either the sternum rub or the clavicle pinch. And as I'm going towards this patient and about to kneel down and check for responsiveness, the captain of the fire engine grabs my shoulder and pulls me back. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this wasn't just like a, hey, bud, stop what you're doing type of pull. This was a get up, don't even think about it pull to where as I stood up, I looked at him. And if this man did not have a red helmet, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> oh, boy. But as I looked at him and he looked at me, he took his hand. And for any of you that have been in the military, understand what a knife hand is. A knife hand is a way that military members tend to point. And it's not just with one finger. It is with all five fingers. And they point in the direction that they want you to look. And they point with such a ferocity that you are forced to look. So I looked. And right in the path of where my knee was going to drop to check for responsiveness was a hypodermic needle. I wasn't situationally aware. So that right there changed my outlook. So in situational awareness, we have six steps, okay? Now, according to EMS educator and author Rom Duckworth, there are six steps to achieving situational awareness. All right, so what are they? Well, I'm going to read them off real quick, and then we're going to delve into them a little bit. We're going to perceive, process, predict, decide, take action, and lastly, communicate. Now, when I say perceive, what do I mean? Well, this is the time to, to look at all the cues and clues that go along with your scene. Is there anything that stands out to you? Is there anything that doesn't seem right? Is this a hostile situation? This is your perception of what's going on. Now, as we process, this is the time that we seek and scan. We, we take the cues and clues, and now we're going to seek and scan and process our environment and predict. Now, I'm not asking you all to become psychics or anything like that, but we can all kind of understand the predictions that can be made with the cues and clues that we have at our disposal. And then decide, what are we gonna do, okay? Take action, and when I say take action, this, can't, this doesn't need to be something as dramatic as running out the door. This might even be as minuscule as just kind of maybe cracking, making sure the door behind you isn't closed so that you have a good escape route. Making sure you're kind of at an at a angle so that if you need to run, you can. And then, of course, communicate. Now, there's plenty of people to communicate on a scene. We have our patient, our partner, police, and could be a supervisor or a battalion chief. Take the time to communicate what you're thinking so that everyone could be on the same page. Now, as I work in the fire department, I have the ability to work with many different facets of first responders. And I have had the ability to work with uh, the local bomb squad and as they show up, one of them was wearing a t-shirt. And I'll never forget this. This t-shirt said, Bomb Squad, if I'm running, you better keep up. Same type of idea, right? He was communicating. In a way, he was communicating that if you see me running, well, better keep up, bud. And that's what 
the communication we want to talk to of our responder family. Not the fact that if I'm running, you better keep up. But hey, I don't think this this doesn't feel right. So this is what I'm thinking. And if something does transpire, this is my my safety route. This is my way out. Okay, communicate. So as we talk a little bit about the case study um, towards the front of the presentation, the ambush, do you think that anything could have been done to prevent this? Hmm, yeah, that's hard. Because there are yeses and there are noes. Now also in my bio, I forgot to mention that uh, I do hold a bachelor's in emergency management with a focus on homeland security. And one of the things that we can talk about is the fact that there is domestic terrorism, of course, right? But one of the things that in our studies really drilled into my memory is the fact that while these organizations, these domestic terrorists or these terrorism organizations, they are looking for notoriety, but there are people out there, is considered the lone wolf, that really aren't putting anything on social media. They're just going to act. For instance, uh, the Las Vegas shooting. Gentleman went up into a uh, hotel room and fired upon a crowd. There really wasn't anything that would make any security think that that was going to happen. So as you can see, there are yeses and there are nos. And the yes this is, is knowing your district, talking with the relieving crew, asking what did what did what did they see the night before? Oh, hey, there was an altercation at uh, fifteen thirteen Mockingbird Lane. Uh, looked like uh, son and dad got into an argument, so on and so forth. Words were exchanged. We had to show up because there was a fight. It was broken up. So now, if you go out to fifteen thirteen Mockingbird Lane, you may anticipate that there was an altercation last night and this could be retaliation. Oh man, look at all these cute, cute, wonderful dogs here, right? So as we respond to calls all over the place, right? We come up with pups, right? Pups. So one of my best practices that I like is when I show up to a house that has a dog and you know there's a dog there because it's, you hear it and you know the sound of that bark will dictate the size of that dog. You never really hear a chihuahua go woo woo, right? You never hear that. So you know if it's a deep, deep bark, you know it's gonna be a big dog. And now don't get me wrong, while animals are great companions, things like that, where I'm coming from is I do not know that dog and that dog does not know me. So we have to make a judgment call. We have to ensure that possibly animal control can show up to the scene so that way they can control the animal. Now, will that hinder some of our job, taking care of our patient? Possibly. Possibly. But it's something that we need to do to keep ourselves safe. Now, uh, we do know that bigger dogs may tend to bite and rip you know, flesh and so on and so forth, especially when they are afraid or when they're scared or they're not socialized. So we don't know exactly what that dog has been through. So we have to understand that there's that unknown there. So as we deal with the unknowns, we have to look at our hierarchy of situational awareness, right? So this is basically who are we taking care of first? Now, again, I'm going to refer a little bit back to my bio. So again, my bio didn't mention a few things. And one of the things it didn't mention is that in 2010, I was promoted to husband. Later on that year, I was promoted to daddy. And then in 2012, I was promoted to daddy again. And these are jobs I take very seriously, ladies and gentlemen. And I know that people are depending on me. So with that, I ensure that my safety is priority. 
Now, again, there are, are always things that there are Murphy's Law and so on and so forth. But if I can minimize the effects in any way, shape, or form, I'm going to do that. Next is my partner safety. And my partner's safety, crew safety, is just as almost as important as mine is. In fact, that I know that there are people there that, that depend on them as well. So we need to keep ourselves safe. Because as first responders, what are we going to do? We want to help. So if one of us goes down, the other one's going to go and try to help out. And then if that doesn't work, we're going to call for more responders and more responders are going to come. And they, that might ensure more people in danger or more people into um, an emergency situation that could be dangerous. And then it's going to be a pile on pile on pile. So we have to really kind of respect the fact that we have to take care of ourselves then our partner, and then lastly, bystander, and of course, our patient safety. Now, these are the top three. All right, let's go for another poll. I like how interactive this webinar is, and hopefully you guys enjoy it as well. When should you start practicing situational awareness? Now, what I like about this question is it opens it up to interpretation. When do you want to practice your situational awareness? Now for myself, I practice it all the time, even when I'm in a crowded area. I always look for another way out. I always look for the area in which everyone is coming into a building or into a crowded area. Not so much crowded anymore, but because what we found through our studies is that humans tend to go out the same way they came in. When your shift starts. I agree. I agree. When your shift starts. Because from there, there's all different things that you could take into consideration. Temperature, like I said, today's going to be 109 degrees. Um, winds. Now, I, I work in an area where it's very windy. So if we deal with any hazmats, we have to look at which way the winds are going and how fast they're going. And especially right now during hot, windy season here in California, that is, that is prime time for wildland season. So we have to prepare for that. And as I also talk about the heat today, also thinking about the geriatric population, the young population. Okay, people that may be susceptible to environmental emergencies. All right, so let's get into some tips and tricks here. So what you want to do is you want to learn what clues to scene safety you should be alert to. For example, stand to the side of doors and windows, not in front. Size up the entrances and exits, look for a clear escape, and know how many people are on the scene. So accountability. But let's get to this first one. So as I was taking the National Registry years and years ago, uh, I would do a lot of practice tests. And one of, in one of the practice tests, it asked me, when standing in front of a door, where should you knock? And it gave a multiple different answers, right? But one answer stood out to me the most. And this one was stand off to the side, back against the, a wall, putting your possibly your left hand out, and knocking low. Now, what does this do? The person behind the door, who would probably, you know, the person behind the door may have ill intentions. And if they come barreling out or even shoot through the door, you're not in harm's way. Size up the entrances and exits and always look for a clear escape. Again, you know, always looking for an escape. You know how many people are on the scene, accountability, and not just rescuers, but possibly, you know, other bystanders. When do you think it's going to get a little bit out of control, where it goes from a, a sim simple little call to a group gathering and then eventually to a riot? Could that happen? Yes, it can. 
So understand your scene and understanding as it's gaining momentum are more and more and more people coming to the scene. And, and how was that feeling? How was the, how was the environment changing? Identify anything that could hide a weapon or be used as a possible weapon. Be especially cautious when approaching vehicles. There are many hiding places for weapons, and vehicles itself can serve as a deadly weapon. Now let's touch on this a little bit. A few years ago, we had a kind of a trend going on. I haven't really read anything recently about it, thank goodness, but it was a trend where people were committing suicide by chemicals. They'd park their car in a garage, they'd have a five gallon bucket in their car and in that car was chemicals that created a toxic environment within the vehicle and as ems responders would show up or firefighters would show up and break the window they would then be exposed to this toxic gas that was created and then themselves would be part of the, the scene itself so take a look at the vehicle so the vehicle may pose as a weapon All right, let's talk a little bit about scene safety right now. So in this picture at the right shows what you see when you enter the front door of a residence for an unspecified medical call. What do you notice that could be a potential issue for you and your partner in regards to layout of the house? Do you see any potential safety issues due to the nature of the call? So let's look at this. Safety issues. All right, so we have stairs. Okay, so a if our patient is upstairs, we have to bring them downstairs. So maybe start thinking about a stair chair, a mega mover. You know, we can't take the gurney up those stairs. Can those stairs have someone at the top potentially there to do us harm? Yes. So should we dedicate our whole body into that house right away? Probably not. Maybe step in, make contact with a homeowner or resident and kind of do a quick scan of the area. Seek and scan. Okay, we also want to look for those cues and clues. Also, look at those doorways. Doorways off to our left. Now, people could be hiding in those. And it does look like that is a very narrow hallway, so maybe the gurney may not fit all the way through there. Looks like we have a, a nook in the back area. Okay. So, we can look at all these potential issues that we may face just in this area alone. Now, thank goodness this, this home doesn't have anything else. You know, we've definitely seen the houses that have things stacked up on either side and making patient contact is difficult, to say the least. And that poses another problem. So let's say we go upstairs, take our stair chair. We've made sure that we've, we've communicated our, we've decided that we're going to take a stair chair up. We've communicated that to our partner. We're going upstairs. Now we find this. Okay, let's say uh, young Anne here is unresponsive on a bed. But before we go and make patient contact, let's look at some of the things that could possibly be dangerous to us. To us. Okay, we have a um, bottle of pills. Right, up, right up, off the bat, I see a bottle of pills. I see a pocket knife. I see a packet of pills. What else do we see? We see a couple water bottles there. Now, in a perfect world, those are filled with water. But not today, maybe they're filled with something else. Okay, they're completely empty, there's two of them. Could those have been filled with some sort of alcohol? Could that have been filled with some sort of chemical? Okay, what are in those pill bottles? What do they say? And it looks like one's empty, and let's check the date. If we look at the date and it says that she got this bottle of pills two days ago, and now they're all gone. That raises some red flags. This pocket knife, and then if you look under her hand, it looks to be like a uh, scalpel or a, a pocket knife or some sharp object there. So this person right here may have thought about suicide, had suicide ideations. And as we discuss in our classes, a lot of times people that have these ideations may want to take someone out with them. So we have to be very, very careful. Okay, it looks like we also have uh, off to her left side, we have a mirror there. 
you know, we could check the mirror for any kind of, you know, drug paraphernalia or, or so on and so forth. But you could see how all these cues and clues, as we seek and scan, right, help us determine what should be our next course of action. Mechanism injury or index of suspicion right there. Again, and also keeping our guard up. Check it out, scan the area, look for that situational awareness. All the arrows pointing to clues that can help us determine what what we're trying to what are we looking for and what can help us with our treatment all the while keeping us safe all right again with this ever changing world um, we are dealing now with rescue task force I know in my department we are uh, a rescue task force with our county. And so we do have the flak vest, we do have the the uh, helmets and our task force bags and dealing with tourniquets and going in with police officers. But as we arrive on scene and we notice, we get that feeling that this is getting a little escalated. Now what are some things that we can do? Right here it says to speak calmly and in a very controlled, quiet voice, right? Bring down that situation. Bring it down. Use different terms, such as, hey, slow, slow down, instead of calm down. Calm down can be seen as you're being, you're, you're talking down to them. You're belittling them. You want to address people's questions and fears. So right here, when I say address people's questions and fears, one of my Things that I pride myself on when on an EMS call is understanding the process of the EMS call. And the reason I like to understand the process is because I like to communicate that process. I know for me, when there is less unknown, I feel more at ease. So as I'm talking to someone who is called us for an emergency for a medical call, I'll discuss, hey, this is what's happening now. We're going to take your vitals, okay? And then I'll kind of discuss with you kind of the options that we have. Then we're going to get you on the gurney, get you to the hospital, and from there, they're going to do a lot more tests. We're going to get you an IV, explaining to them things that are happening as they happen. So that way, they know what is coming next. There's no surprises because already they're surprised. They, they shouldn't be having this medical call or they're afraid. They're scared. But by being there and communicating, both your intentions and what is going to happen can make all the difference. Use the resources around you as tools to protect yourself. Now, this could be anything from you know putting a couch between you and the assailant. This could even be using the family member. Hey, can you calm down your, your cousin, your friend, your brother? Can you calm them down? Can you talk with them? I'm just trying to help. This is what we're here for. We're here to help. They're not listening to us. Can you talk to them? Utilize your resources. Law enforcement, if you feel that you need to back out of the situation completely, then that is what you feel and be sure to communicate that. All right, so let's get into the secondary scene assessment. So as we deal with trauma, right, we all know that in trauma you do your primary assessment and we're looking for life threats. If you're in the fire service, you know that we do a primary search, which is a real quick search, and then we get into our secondary search, which is a little bit more thorough search, and just like in a second assessment, we get into a little bit more thorough, getting the vitals, getting the respiratory rates, things like that, get, once they're in the ambulance. Same thing with situational awareness. Primarily, you come up, and your six steps, you want to you know, perceive, you know, and, and get through all of that, all the way to decide and take action. And then we're going to do it again. Okay, first responders should also be taught to do a secondary assessment that includes checking for weapons before transporting the patient. A quick visual scan or a brief searching of layered clothing can identify a concealed hazard. So, sorry, here is I was a fire medic on a truck company, and we arrived to a, a, a scene where there were police officers, and there was a bit of an altercation. So. We go ahead and check our patient, the assailant, and we check them out, make sure they're, they're good. And as we're 
you know, doing a trauma assessment, he had a large bottle of cologne in his pocket. That wasn't even good cologne, but it was cologne nonetheless, and it was in a glass bottle. Now, had we shown up and not – and just put him in the ambulance and all that stuff, and he had gotten loose, he could have definitely used, definitely used that bottle of cologne as a weapon. So we have to be on top of it. We have to check our patient because as we assess our scene safety throughout the call, we have to keep vigilant. We have to keep on looking, right? Communication is and will forever be key. Remember that every member of the EMS crew has a responsibility to be an active participant in scene safety. Communication is vital, and each responder should carry a handheld portable radio that can be used to alert dispatch of a medic in distress. You may also want to set up a simple code between you and your partners that can be used in a dangerous situation without heightening the suspicion of the aggressor. This brings up a movie I saw. It's, uh, it's a movie starring Vince Vaughn and Reese Witherspoon called Four Christmases. Now, in this movie, this couple has to go to all the different parents' house for Christmas. And as they arrive to Vince Vaughn's father's house, he tells his girlfriend, Reese Witherspoon, it's crazy in there. If you feel you don't want to go in there, you don't want to be there anymore, we got to have, have a code. We got to have a code word. And they use the term code. They use the, I'm sorry, they use the term mistletoe. Now, in this movie, he says he's getting beaten up by his brother, and you could just hear him say, M mistletoe, mistletoe. That's the code. Of course, you didn't hear it you know, that, as the comedy of it, but same premise. There has to be a code. It could be – this is a code four. It's a code nine. Code nine means we're backing out or you know, something between you and your partner to communicate in a way that you can silently just kind of peel off. Now, this is a way for you not to anger anyone or a way for you to exit the scene that you feel that is hostile or even perk up the ears of your partner that this is getting hostile. Then, of course, reevaluate. Right? As I said before, when we're doing our national registry skills, we always say scene safe at the very, very beginning. And we never say it again. Now we need to continuously reevaluate our scene to ensure that we are safe and that our scene is continuously safe. The important thing is to remember any scene at any time can become dangerous. Each person on your crew has a responsibility to keep each other safe, including any trainee or ride along. Communication is key and communication is vital to obtaining more resources and help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. If you feel that this situation is getting out of control, back up, call on the radio for backup. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with asking for help, even if you think you have the situation under control. I like to explain that there is no ego on the emergency scene, the fire scene. There's no ego. Yeah, I know we all want to be the hero and want to solve the problem, but ultimately we also all want to go home. It is best practice to prepare for it is best practice to prepare for potential scene degradation and ask for a backup. Doing so before the scene degrades may be one of the best options to avoid scene chaos and volatility. Now if you start to feel things are getting out of control, adding numbers in your favor helps everyone stay safe. So like you said, if things are getting a little bit out of control, then please, please reach out, get some backup so that everyone can be safe. Adding to the numbers, keep them in your favor. In conclusion, there are things concerning scene safety you can control and things we can't. Our scenes are dynamic and ever-changing, so keep reassessing your safety. One of the only things you can control fully is yourself, so you need to train yourself to recognize red flags. Prepare your body and mind to react quickly and efficiently to dangers. Communicate with your partner and team frequently and be, pre be prepared to always stay vigilant. These are our references that we 
okay, to provide you this wonderful information. And now we're going to open it up to some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, we have had a few questions come in so far. So the first is, what are some recent dangers that have arisen for first responders that maybe weren't risks a few years ago? Well, I think right now, one of those is the uh, active shooter. The active shooter, we've seen that those grow in number consistently through the high school, through um, open area concepts. So with that being said, um, you know, I never thought joining the fire department that I'd ever have to have a bulletproof vest on my rig, but now we do. So years ago, that wasn't even thought of, but now it's it's becoming a staple. You know, that along with uh, the increase in PPE use as we go through our coronavirus uh, protocols, the the gowns and the face shields, you know, preparing a little bit more as we arrive on scene. You know, it, two years ago, if you would ask me that we have to follow a full CDC guideline on just responding to any respiratory emergency, I would have thought you were crazy, but that is becoming the norm. And with all these changes, how do you and your department stay up to date on all the new hazards and dangers? Well, we're, we're blessed in our department to have a health and safety officer, and this person is charged with um, looking at reference material, staying up to date on local county protocols, state protocols, and uh, national protocols and following kind of trends that are happening within our environment. So they have taken that information and resources and really uh, been the tip of the spear when it comes to uh, providing that communication to the rest of the department so that we can all see that there is a trend happening and how we can keep ourselves safe from becoming um, casualties of that trend. Here's another question we have from one of the attendees. Uh, what are some tips you know now about developing situational awareness you wish you had known five years ago? Some of the tips that, that I have for developing situational awareness um, is to consistently assess the scene. You know, like I said, you know, we're, we're taught in uh, paramedic school, EMT school, that you say scene safe at the very beginning of your, of your skill set and then you never think about it again but that doesn't necessarily happen you have to consider it continuously throughout the call so having the idea of assessing and reassessing your call will help you to stay on top if there even is any idea of the scene turning hostile great uh, we have another question, and this one comes from someone who mentioned that sometimes they can have uh, difficult situations within their department. And so they were asking, um, as someone on the, as personnel, how they can make their department safer and try and help promote situational awareness when that might not always be the case on the department level or in their culture. So that starts with that starts with the one person. Um, you know, one thing they say about us in emergency response is that we hate change and we hate things to stay the same, right? So it's, it, it, it's a touchy subject, but one of the things is we have to be the change we want to see in the world. And with that, it can start with you. You know, be the one that overdoes the PPE, you, who wants to remain safe. And if you have to sell it consistently, then sell it till you're blue in the face. Eventually, one person will jump on board, and then another, and then another, especially when it comes to uh, doing this not just for me, but it's for my family. You know, right now, we are dealing with um, COVID-19, and we do have um, some um, conflict in our department about PPE. You know, but at the end of the day, our protocols are written. And that's what we follow. And as a company officer, it is my job to enforce those protocols, regardless of how I feel. Now, I'm all for the PPE. I'm all for it, 100%. But we do have people that are not for, you know, wearing a mask just while in, in while inside the department, not responding. But it is on our protocols to to emphasize that and to exercise it. And 
as a company officer, I will I will enforce our protocols because that is what we decided on, and that is for the best of not just our department but of the community we serve. Wonderful. And we have a great comment here from Larry, and he mentioned um, some intelligent resources. Uh, one was Tripwire um, and learning libraries and other resources. Do you know of other resources that are out there, Ricky, that you love to go to to learn a little bit more about situational awareness or other best practices? Uh, not that, not off the top of my head. I know that I refer a lot to uh, YouTube and videos from other departments, and not in a way to play Monday morning quarterback, but a way to understand, you know, what I would have done, and what could I have done, or you know, that, that was a great practice that they did, and how can I adopt that into my day to day. So th right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a wonderful time in the fact that we have so much social media so much resources that we can refer to anyone like take for instance right now where i'm speaking to you guys from california and we may do something that's different from someone who's in kansas but we can reach out to each other and we can discuss it and how that how how their department does it versus how our department does it and i may adopt some things and they may adopt some things that that we practice so we are in a great time of communication right now and of resources. I've been able to reach out to many mentors in both the first responder world and the military world in a sense that we can gain from their experience and we can gain from their knowledge. So uh, honestly, when it comes to resources, they're all around us. I, I wish I had some more that could really drive home this, this, uh, this discussion, uh, but I sadly, I don't have any. Perfect. Well, and I know too, uh, the references listed on the screen are other great places where people can go for more information. Um, and like you said, that, that networking, that is so important. Um, right now, it looks like that is the end to our questions. Are there any last thoughts that you had, Ricky, before we close out? No, no, there, there isn't. Uh, I just want to say thank you again to everyone from joining for joining me with on this webinar. It's been an amazing experience, and I'm so glad that we can get this message of situational awareness to all of you. Wonderful, and thank you so much, Ricky, for joining us today, and thank you, everyone. We loved sharing this important conversation with you, and we would love to continue the conversation. So please visit us at careercert.com for more webinars and free resources to help prepare you to best protect yourself, your fellow providers, and your patients. And thank you again for connecting with us today. Thank you so much for your sacrifice to make our communities safer places. Take care. <laughs>